All right, we've gone through most of the book. It looks formidable, but breathes easy. Uh, I'll try to combine intertwine, let's see, buzzword, both the topic about the role of public service in public life and the book as it runs along. Now, uh, one thing strikes me, uh, I enter public service almost in a fit of this place, patriotism, having left a perfectly good job, uh, life is a series of mistakes. Now, I keep wondering why we use, why we assume that public service leads to a public servant. You can be a member of the veterinary service. That does not make you a veterinary servant. Are you getting it? You belong to any service and yet not be classified as a servant of that service. So there is some fuzziness somewhere that crept in at an early stage when there was an attempt, perhaps a unanimous societal attempt, to curb the dreaded bureaucrat and term him as a public servant. The dread of the bureaucracy is a universal phenomenon and uh, I've tried to figure out what is the legal standing of a public servant in India because one has to get, one gets into frequent problems on these accounts. Uh, the only legal document where I find him, or the earliest legal document where we find the term public servant in India is the same document that describes rape, describes murder, describes crime, theft, and everything. It's a document of 1861, the Indian Penal Code. Uh, there is a subtle uh, uh, message running through it all, that the public service official definition comes under the Indian Penal Code. Not under there, just a matter of revelation. It comes under section 21, which has been serially amended to cover even door-to-door -door enumerators. The Supreme Court and others keep giving you instructions. It covers university officials, practically anyone who has been funded by public funds. That's it. Now, having said that and having taken the very sacred origins from the Indian Penal Code, one must ponder as to how the term has actually been appropriated by the bureaucracy, which is only a small layer. I mean, when I talk about the bureaucracy, I'm referring to the higher echelons. I'm not referring to the practice right breaking counter talk. He's very much a part of the bureaucracy. Now, uh, the issue that strikes us is the public service in India, which as you know has no pretensions to either be public or servant. I start with that. Why it still attracts for that? persons to sit for it, to sit for it every year, to something that only less than 200 would qualify for the IAS and IAS. And what happens thereafter? If you assume that even this year, this year also less than 200 persons enter through one of the competition, the question is what happens thereafter? That could itself could be an engaging debate on public service the traumatization that happens by politicians, by by choice, by choice. I knew full well when I entered the IAS that I was entering into a service of four years. I was not prepared for the 19th, for the first decade of the 2000, or even the second decade of the 21st century, because I found a lot of them had crossed over from four years to port of dance. We'll cross over. Now, the next, the main roots of the problem lie in the structuring and the legitimization of authority in the hands of those selected by processes. In other words, the pizza is cooked in a pizza oven. If it comes out burnt, you can have a word on it. That. Otherwise, if it comes out perfect, the way you put it in, the way you got it out, we need to really ponder as to what's going on. The 21, 31 years 
that with Indian civil service, the Indian public service as we call it now, is an area where I've done some work and I was discussing with my young friend, uh, Sajid Dobra. It starts with 1761, when the first wisps of power come into the hands of the British, who come in with different sets of views, morals, via a lack of morals, world views, Com completely different set of way of looking at life when you contrast it with the putrid way in which the last stages of post mobile administration in India were running itself. I have used terms which are strong but we can, no, no lesser terms can describe the last stages of the post mobile era. 21 to 30 years, I mean it can start somewhere arbitrarily and end somewhere. I would prefer to start it. 1765, the assumption of Diwani, the first legit document the company had, and will end with 1793, when the structure of the service that you face today was being determined, was being concretized. I am not saying that nobody on earth had an opportunity thereafter to change it. In fact, there were scores of opportunity. But this course were let go on, in fact. This small one article that I've written on, on how uh, India's best Prime Minister also missed out this opportunity. Now, coming to the book for a minute, uh, this is actually not of a public servant. This is by someone who has the trappings of a public servant because he has to be given a designation and therefore work within the structure of public service, but is not a public servant in that sense of the term. Why would I not admit, let us say, Mr. Huxley into public service or into the bureaucracy? I'm making them portraits. Because I would never be able to write Hinduji to the Prime Minister. I would never be able to have a drink as a joint secretary with the Prime Minister. I've had it with the chief minister, but that's beside the point. Uh, so, these things happen. Now, this is a bit of strong, legitimized insider trading. Let's face facts. We need to go back and peg, peg the years to understand what the scene was. I was calculating that I was 66 going on 67, and this was Gandhi, who I thought was a very dignified and a very um, very strong woman I thought was something like my grandmother actually died at my age. So whatever she did was within these years. We need to make ourselves relevant by pinpointing years and I fooled around with the years Jaram Ramesh of Jewel or somewhere else and so Mr. Uh, Aksar joins diplomacy or the diplomatic service at 34 and he works for 20 years, 1947-1967. Uh, his highest posting other than ambassador was also deputy. I mean those, that, those days they were not so strict that after ambassador you could be different. That equivalences that we insist upon had not been so structured. He is selected for the post of a deputy high commissioner of uh, India in London a post that all of us who passed through London have exploited fully, have removed a part of this that we have given to Mother India through the office of the Deputy High Commissioner or the High Commissioner. And the Deputy High Commissioner is really not taken as that seriously. I mean that thing. From that he makes a lateral jump as the principal secretary to Prime Minister. So as I said, he tramples over all the rules. Did he? And that's interesting. He did not. That age permitted this flexibility. Before the IAS managed to harden everything beyond redemption. The question popped by a rather, um, by a rather, uh, uh, okay, a question popped about taking 10 joint secretaries, professional joint secretaries, laterally to add to 470 has given rise to a huge debate because by the difference between Mr. Huxer coming in 1967 
and this issue being raised in 2018 is that it is all past, written code, world and taboo. Is that true? Is that true? That's a separate issue altogether. Now coming back to Mr. Haksar and Hinduji's, uh, he comes in and joins Madam and uh, he works as a, as, a, as a principal secretary and as Jairam Ramesh supported so rightly, there are only two principal secretaries who are well started. Rajesh Mishra of the Atal Bihari Rajesh Mishra regime, man who far exceeded the assignment of his post and made his impact and impacted on public policy and Mr. P. N. Hatsa. The rest are not worth looking at. When I that I can certify after 42 years. I that Mr. P. K. Nair would run for cover if you tried to find out a bit of what he did or he did. Pulak, for instance, would drop the phone if ever the subject was raised, though he had rather longest stint as Perfidan, private secretary, principal private secretary, whatever. He is very right on that score. The book is, as Mr. Ramesh puts it, a narrative, which is my book. He doesn't get into subjectivity, he doesn't follow from at every stage, doesn't lead you on, leads you to thinking or working out your own conclusions. It provides a huge amount of data for us who have now really, really fallen back on secondary and tertiary data <coughs> to base our postulates. None of us except in data, a dedicated researcher ever has the time to go back to primary data because it just takes too much time. He has taken the trouble to extract this primary data, snip it, comb it, cut it to size and give it to us. There is a certain amount of selectivity involved in editing that primary data, but I thank him for this, what I call the archival data. This period of the other significance of this book is Mr. Haksar was a maniacal record keeper, the last of it. He lived in an era which was pre-Wikipedia, pre-WikiLeaks, pre-Leaks and pre-RTI. After RTI, which happened somewhere after two-thirds of my service career, we learned how to write notes for the courts. Very small one. And we learned how to put, I'm sure you know it, yellow stick on pads, what actually has to be done, typed out in case somebody pulls out that yellow slip and tries to use it as evidence. It was all typed out that option three better have been please be taken. But while writing the note, the notes were as bland as one has been taught to make them, as objective as possible, and as open as democratic, as far free as were expected, but the yellow stick on board saying that boss wants it pronto, promptly. And para three may be acted upon is what happened. So we'll never get that Hatsa type notes at hand. That is one of the sturdy losses we have in the system. Mr. Pradesh Mishra, who preceded the WikiLeaks RTI period, just about, just about, also did not keep notes. So in a way, if you contextualize, you'll find that this is perhaps the last use or the last such data being put to good use. We have 100 questions to ask. Kashmiri Pandit was only one of them. was teasing that. Kashmiri Pandit was only one of them. There are hundreds of questions. I, for instance, would like to know what was the impact of the tumultuous 60s on state policy. Because no bureaucrat would ever record it that because there is an accelerate insurrection there, we are going to do this. A, the joining the dots is something, is a skill that does, does not exist if you work in Bhavan too long. And even if you can join the dots, you are not supposed to put it on paper and leave it for posterity. One of them. Number two, how much impact did the 
Whereas how do I put them? They were definitely Marxists. I, I call them a private conversation, Alipur Baligan Marxists. How much impact would the Alipur Baligan Marxists combine their privilege with protest? And how does deadly combination of privilege with protest, especially uh, intubated on foreign shores, impact the policies of others? That's a question. How much of it would be actually been uh, played out on public policy? These are questions we need to ask. Because new debates have been thrown up about the loss of time, about the dreadful waste of the Nehruvian era. This relates to what I would call post Nehruvian era, but is a continuum of Nehruvian era, but needs to be distinct from the Nehruvian era. In fact, the word Nehruvian era needs to be hyphenated with the Nehruvian era era. Because the two were as different from each other, except a common philosophy running through all of them. One went in for uh, structured socialism, the other went in for populism or welfareism. Now populism, which is such a dirty word, welfareism, which is such a dirty word, is only the recycling of the finances that have been acquired by state power and reusing them in a particular direction instead of allowing, let us say, them to be filched from the banks. There are different uses one can make of capital uh, acquired. Now this is a period when the economy was restructured, completely restructured. And the question I asked, I will be that for no fault of mine, an active participant of this era, would India be able to face the world with these restructurings had not taken place? Is Gariti Hatao, as later implemented by us, which I have to work in through 10 point, 20 point programs, and this program, and that program, they were operationalized through these programs. To you who may not have been privy to how it all operationalized itself out, they were programmed. So that end of how slogans like Gariti Hatao were actualized is a part that I would perhaps know. Did we really lose an opportunity to liberalize at the right time, whatever the time that is? So we are in the second phase of the Nehru Indira era, and this is where the facts have been brought out by persons who matter. This is an authoritative narration of a fact, of facts at that point of time, the compulsions that drove decisions, the desires and the ideologies that cast that shadow on them. I was comparing just a few words here and there. 67 was the Naxalite uprising, if you may choose to call it. 68 was a very exciting year of it, over my classmate and I would remember. 68 was when uh, students from all over Europe walked hand in hand of Shah Zinazif to dislodge the Gaul. 69 was a cultural revolution. Those were days. And India could not insulate itself. Could India insulate itself by declaring itself to be Peronist right at that point of time? Would the safety net for survival exist? Or would a safety net of survival be needed to be put in position before other luxuries went in? I have nothing against particular forms of economics because simple reason I don't understand any one of them. Uh, did we lose the opportunity? That is one of the most privileged, one of the most important questions. I would put it like this. If you just look back, this month's biggest announcement is that we have crossed a billion firm connections. A nation of 1.25 billion as trust has now connection connectivity for 1 billion plus. 1 billion plus by the release of economic energies, otherwise known as liberalization, in case you thought I was going to be anti liberalization No, I'm not. We are neither pro nor anti whatever works best is best. So you have 1 billion landlines produced by 
by as I have called the release energies in the telecom sector with all 2Gs and 3Gs and all the standards put together, you still have 1 million landlines. And you have 25 million landlines for an overstocked public sector that was put during this year. Was the cookie at that point of time very relevant? It may have. Did it outlive its utility? Perhaps. These are questions we need to ask ourselves when we go back in retrospect. But collectively, all of India has been held criminalized because we did not jump off into liberalization at that particular point of time. So these are questions that have come out through this excellent narrative or the excellent archival recording that Jaram Ramesh has done. And from that part, from that point of view, I would say this is a major contribution to the to human knowledge, to factual record. The rest of it, as I said, you have to be, be angular enough to ask that question, and you need to have that angularity for hope to extract that answer. A part of it will definitely come out. Too many questions are being raised. Too much hatred is being sown. I am sure we have views on dynasty. I am sure most of us have views on dynasty. But one simple question of a simple Indian. To found a dynasty, you must at least acknowledge your wife. We move on. Now, uh, we move on. there are issues that come and come in. And this retrospective criminalizing of policy, economic policy decision needs to be lambasted at some point of time, we do not need to have right hagiographies of all past public policy. No, certainly not. But we need to take a rational view that rises above sheer hatred of the inferior. That is a message. I thank uh, Ashoka and, uh, and ORF. I thank Jaram Ramesh for bringing out the book. And every time I come to a centre like this, a rather opulent, I am reminded of the centre with which I am associated with, happens to be one of the oldest social science research centres, CSSS, unabashedly left and liberal, uh, still surviving the depredations of rather decisive, decisive governments that have decided. When I come and see, the stability of such places, I have a bit of envy and respect. Because we live on prelude there at the St. Uh, thank you once again. I hope I have been able to provoke a few questions. And if I have rattled you, my purpose is done. Thank you.